This is the man from Modesto. I've been praying for several weeks to put together this message, and this message is called How to Draw Near to God. Now, there are really three main components. The first component, I already published a video on that issue. It's called The Three Tiers of Christianity from the Holy Spirit. Now, the main thing is, is that the tiers really are created based upon your relationship with God, how you make decisions in the world, and how that affects your behavior, the kinds of things you do. So that the highest tier of Christianity in this message from the Holy Spirit were people who conduct warfare on behalf of Jesus. They are weeping and crying day and night to conduct warfare against the enemy. There are people who don't live solely for themselves. The key thing is that all these things were based on relationship with God and also how you make decisions and also your behavior that comes out derivative of your decision-making process. So all these things affect your person and, it, and watch that video. It gives you a tool to kind of make an assessment of yourself and to consider there are scriptures in there for you to look at and say, uh, am I living according to this word of God? How do I live? How do I make my decision? So you start to change how you think and how you behave by looking at the scripture. The second part of this message is called uh, making changes. So when people have a transformative moment, so you have this moment where you experience the power of God. You see a man who is blind be healed by a Christian evangelist on the street somewhere, and it just completely changes how you think. And that's what brings people out of the lowest level of Christianity into a place where they really have a reverence for God and desire to start changing their life. Now, if you've had that, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, uh, you need to go out and seek God more actively. This is what the Holy Spirit told me. He said, when people have this transformative moment, they will also receive, most of them will also receive a desire to draw near to God. And the Holy Spirit said, you should let this desire lead you into going out and reading the scripture, into going out and trying to find out what does God want for my life and to actively seek after those things and to not try to restrain or limit this desire in any way. Let it grow in your life. So if, you, if you're sitting somewhere and you think, man, I, really, I haven't read the Bible in a while, I really want to, go do it. If you're sitting somewhere and you think, I just want to fellowship with someone else who wants to know God as much as I do, then pray that God will bring a person like that into relationship with you and then go out and spend time with that person, right? So you don't want to hinder the Holy Spirit in any way. Do not constrain your natural desire to go out and seek God. And that obviously makes sense that that will help you draw near to God. Now, number two, make sacrifices. And this is the example the Holy Spirit gave me. So there's a man and he sees, wow, there's a new big screen theater, you know, movie coming out. Woohoo, I want to go see this movie. God said, instead of doing that, take an hour, go somewhere, you won't be disturbed, and sit and read the scriptures. Said, so make a sacrifice. You're going to take away your standard Saturday silver screen theater visit, and you're going to replace it with reading your scripture for an hour. And then the rest of the time you save from driving out to theater and whatever, you're going to go to the store, buy some food, go and visit your mama, uh, make some lunch together, uh, eat lunch together, talk about family, talk about whatever's going on in, in both of your lives, and then clean up together, give her a kiss on the cheek and go home, right? This is what God is telling me. So visiting your family, respecting your mother, right? Uh, this is a more of a godly thing than going to the theater. So again, in this example, we see behavior. How do you spend your time, right? So you want to draw near to God, make changes, make sacrifices. That's the second thing, right? So number one, don't limit the Holy Spirit. Number two, make some sacrifices in where you spend your time and your money. Number three, minimize relationships that involve worldly activities. So for example, let's say there are two guys and one of them is being drawn toward God and he wants to draw near to God. But he has another friend that always goes clubbing and he's always inviting him to go clubbing. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna say, listen, I'm not gonna go clubbing anymore because I've, I've made a decision to change how I live. So I'm not gonna go with you clubbing anymore. But listen, Saturday morning, I go to this car wash and I wash my car. Why don't you drive on up, meet me there at nine o'clock, we'll clean our cars together. So every Saturday, these two guys 
clean their car, uh, they vacuum it out, whatever, and they spend some time talking. Now, the guy who's seeking God, he's praying for his friend to also leave out the rotten lifestyle, again, to change his behavior, to become a man closer to God, to draw nearer to God, right? Maybe this guy's a pseudo-Christian, maybe he's never made a commitment to Jesus, right? So he's gonna be praying for his friend, and he's gonna pray for an opportunity. At some point, there's gonna be this opportunity. Listen, I have a, a promotion that's coming up, I really want it. So the guy prays for him, and maybe while he's praying, God shows him something significant Right? Something uncommon, unexpected that's going to happen, that's going to help him to get the promotion. Hey, listen, that guy that everyone thinks is going to get the promotion, he's actually going to get a different job and he's going to leave the company and then you're going to get the job. Wow, there's no expectation of that. And then that's exactly what happens. So this guy has seen the power of prayer and it's potentially a transformative moment for this guy. He might see God in that and have a desire to now see God himself. If nothing else, the bare minimum is, this guy's gonna see, wow, prayer works. These Christians have something special, and he's going to then, then be much more open somewhere down the road when someone preaches to him the need for salvation. So now, so that was the second part. So you want to begin to make changes in your life. So again, we're talking about behavior. You want to draw near to God, you look at your behavior. How do you make decisions in this first part, right? How are, are you desiring to serve God? Now in the second part, uh, you're gonna make these decisions, right? Uh, you're gonna decide to uh, let your desire for God flow naturally and to grow naturally. Number two, you're gonna make sacrifices how you spend your time. Number three, you're going to look at your relationships and you're going to excise what is bad and you're going to minimize contact with other people that are still doing those things. Now listen to this. Here's the scripture from Jeremiah. Now remember, a lot of people don't talk about this, but Jeremiah, even though he was a great prophet, had a time where he went away from God and God called him back. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, if you return, then will I bring you again, and you shall stand before me. And if you take forth the precious from the vile, so, so there's all this rottenness, but you're just gonna take out what's good, right? So again, there's this separation of things, right? If you take out the precious from the vile, then you shall be as my mouth. Wow, if you're the mouthpiece of God, that is a closeness uh, that all of us can envy, right? Wow, that guy is close to God, right? So let them return to you, but you do not return to them. So there they are out making their decisions based on the ways of the world. How am I gonna pick my wife? The sexiest woman that will, that will say yes, right? How am I gonna pick my job? Who pays the most, right? There's no prayer involved in these kind of decisions. That's what they're doing. Thing. So you take out from the world what is good and you leave out what is rotten, right? So what's good? People praying to God on how to make a decision, what job to take, who they should propose marriage to, right? Who they choose as a spouse, these kinds of things like this. Now, part three is a message for everyone. This message is called endurance. Now listen to this, James chapter one, verse four. James, I love this book. People don't emphasize it enough. They're always telling new believers to go read John, but you could just as easily, maybe even better, tell them to go read James. It's so chock full of instructions. And James, in, in James, it's really clear that it is important to actually change how you live and the heart, your own heart behind what you're doing. James said, you know, you have, you have not received what you need because when you prayed for an increase, you only wanted that increase so that you could go out and live more wickedly, so that you could go out and buy more alcohol, you could buy more drugs, you could get a faster car to more impress the ladies when you arrive at the club. You know, you prayed in the wrong way, right? That's why you didn't receive. So James is so mighty and powerful. James 1.4. But let patience have its perfect work. Wow, there's some kind of patience can affect perfection here. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wow, patience is such a big, big message, right? So an integral part to you drawing near to God is patience. Now, when I was first saved, when I first got saved, one of the first dreams God showed me was how this thing was gonna work with me and him. And what I saw was this very simple dream, just a flat surface, 
nothing on it, and the only thing there is this inchworm. And the inchworm is all stretched out like this, and very slowly, you know, the front part of the inchworm, he stays in place, and the back starts walking, dun, 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 you know, and he starts approaching, and as he's going, you know, he, the inchworm, he arches up like this, right? And then he holds on with the back, and he lets go with the front, and he sticks out, boom, boom, and then he falls, and now he suddenly goes, he, all of his stored up capacity goes into one big movement, one big movement forward. And this is what the Holy Spirit has shown me in some other dreams as well, that in your Christian life, you're not going to increase incrementally. There's not some gradual slope to becoming great. Instead, when you look in the Bible, you see that people are prepared. And when they're prepared, they suddenly whoop, Boom, they suddenly go up in a big leap forward, in a big leap above, right? So if you're desiring to serve God, you want to approach God, you want this new relationship in God, listen, you have to endure the whole hum of life because life is going to test you and when and only when you have passed the test, right? Who is honest with a little, who is responsible with a little will also be responsible with a lot. Who is dishonest with a little will also be dishonest with a lot. So God wants to see that at the level that you're on, that you're going to be honest, that you're going to be responsible with it, right? That you're going to take those talents and you're going to multiply them for the kingdom. And then when God arrives, he's going to evaluate you and say, yeah, well done, good and faithful servant. And now, boom, you're going to have tenfold more, sevenfold more, threefold more. He's going to give you an increase based upon what you've been responsible with, something that you can handle. Now, does, now back to this issue of it's Big steps and not a steady curve, right? So you have to endure. You want to draw near to God? Sometimes it's the same old grind, day in and day out. You're going to church. You're serving as an elder. You're working on the prayer team. You're doing something, but nothing is changing for you. Don't worry. That is the standard course of a relationship with God. But you'll be tested. The enemy will test you somehow. And when you show that you're going to make your decision, not based on the way the world makes it, but based on your prayer. But based on your prayer and your relationship with God, based on how you understand the scripture says to behave, and then you will see, then you will understand that God is going to come through. He's going to back up that word. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to increase your faith. It's going to increase your faith. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Just endure. Go through it, right? It's a long race, my friends. Now, this idea of incrementation, let's look at the story of Naaman. Naaman was this great general, and he apparently, that you have to infer just a little bit, was proud of this fact. He was the number two man in the nation where he served. And he heard he had leprosy, this general, and he came to see the prophet Elisha. And Elisha didn't even come out to meet this great man. And I believe that was to challenge Naaman to set aside his pride. And instead, he sent Gehazi, his servant. And Gehazi says, this is what the man of God says. Go and dip yourself in the river Jordan seven times. Naaman thinks this is outlandish. And there are greater rivers in the land where I came from. If I could just dip in the river, I should have done it in my own great rivers and not this Jordan. His, but Naaman's compatriot convinces him, listen, if they had asked you to do something great, you'd do that. This is something simple. Let's just go. So he has to dip himself seven times. Not five, not three, not six. Seven times. So Naaman goes. He dips himself one, two, three times. He comes out. There is no change. It's not like each time it's like one-seventh of the leprosy is gone. Look, it's working. Let's keep going. Uh oh he comes up number two times. Two-sevenths of the leprosy is gone. That's not how it works. He goes down four, five, six times. He comes up. Nothing has changed. He goes down the seventh time, which means 100% obedience to what he was told to do, right? It's a very small test, but he has to set aside his pride in wanting to do something great, something that would elevate the name of Naaman all over the world. I destroyed this city for the man of God, and I earned my cleansing from leprosy. No, just go dip yourself in the water. 
but you have to take the snub that the man didn't come out to see you. You have to go and dip yourself in a river that you think isn't that great, and it has to be obedience. So you go and you take this obedience. The world tested his pride. How big, how important is your pride to you? Is your pride so much that you will go away or will you listen to the word of God? So Naaman went and he dipped all seven times and it came up. And here's something I want to share with you. This is so powerful. It makes me so excited to tell you. Listen, this is how you know that God is your father. When ye receive it, when you receive the thing that is promised, it is better than you expected. It is better than you expected. So when Naaman came up, was he healthy with healthy skin, akin to what a man of his age should expect, of his experience, time spent in the battlefield, in the trenches, sleeping and living in the field conditions? No, like a newborn baby. who He had totally refreshed skin, skin like a newborn child. So Naaman was healed, but he had to be tested and he had to show his obedience. Now let's look at Joseph. What happened to Joseph? Joseph knew he had a calling by God. And maybe, maybe you feel this call to go and serve God. Maybe you feel this call to draw near to God. And Joseph felt it. He had dreams that the weak bowed down to him, that his brothers would bow down to him. And he told them, and what did they do? Joseph found himself. Instead of this steady climb to the greatness that he saw that God was promising to him, instead of that, he found himself being sold into slavery. But Joseph never quit. He never lost his faith in his father, in our almighty God. And what happened? Joseph became the servant for Potiphar. This was his preparation. Potiphar was a wealthy man with lands and wealth and warehouses of grains with flocks and servants, and Joseph managed them all. He became a manager of people and things and goods and wealth and resources. He was framed by Potiphar's wife, and he was in prison, and he stayed there for a long time. But then, through the gifts that God gave him, he was able to come out, and he became the number two man. Not gradually, not in a gradual ascent, but overnight. He was one day in the prison, and the next day he was the number two man in all of Egypt. My friend, your rise is not going to be, is not going to be one step uphill at a time. It's going to be like some miraculous move from the basic plane you're on now, whatever level you, that might be, to something much higher. But you're going to be tested. You have to show our Father in Heaven that you're not going to do it by the way of the world, that you're going to put your trust in Him. That even when, and I'll tell you, I have been in this place and I believe that everyone will be at some time. And maybe you, well, maybe you will be, maybe you won't. But there will be everyone else, people that you respect and trust saying, this is what God said. But you have to say, but this is what God told me. There was a time when there was a missionary that I knew. He was in Kazakhstan. And the Muslims were killing the Christian missionaries. And he wrote to us and he said, listen, listen. I'm afraid many of the people on the team have quit. We're just a few of us left, and I am I am fearing that I will abandon my post. Please pray and ask God what I should do. So I prayed, and God said, you tell him that he should stay. And I went to this forum, and I saw that all these other friends that the man had had all said, pack your things and go. And I was afraid that I would look like a fool. But I said, God, I won't let you down. I'm going to give you a message. And I posted I said, listen, God said, God said, remember the message he gave when you went, that he will provide everything you need. I said, do not abandon your post. You should stay. And I came back the next day and he had posted a message. He said, listen, yesterday, three big brothers arrived from up north. They had been walking three days because they saw that the Muslims were killing people in our area. And they said, we will go down and we will protect these brothers and we will let the mission continue in this place. So you see, sometimes you will be tested. And if you want to rise up, you will be tested. And you have to trust in what God is saying, even though all the rest of the world is saying the wrong thing. You have to trust in what God is saying. And you have to follow God. Put God first, and you will draw near to God. Put God forth, return unto me, and you will be as my mouth. Do not let them corrupt you, but you influence them. You impact the world and transform it. And that is how you draw near to God. We work for God. We stand with God. We obey God. We seek to know his desire in our life. 
Look at King David. When no one else would go out, when no one else would go out against Goliath, David knew. David knew. And suddenly, David became a name everyone knew overnight. He was transformed. He was transformed, not incrementally, but suddenly, and David went up. And who was King David? King David was a man who prayed. He knew at one time, Lord, should I go out and destroy the, Philippine, the Philistines who have come into the valley? And God said, go, and he did, and he won. At a later time, those Philistines returned. Now David knew that the valley had been given to his people, to the sons of Abraham. And David knew, he had been told once, go out and kill them. But this second time, he didn't just say, I already know what God wants, I'm gonna go. He prayed, he said, Lord, there they are again. Should I go again? God said, yes. He said, how should I go? Because the previous time, God told him, just ride in through the mouth of the valley and engage them. And he did, and that with that direct head-on assault, he was victorious. But this time, God said, you will not go in that way. You will come in through the grove of cedars. And he said, okay, when? When do I go? He said, when you hear me going before you. Listen to this perfect obedience. David prayed about every step of the way, every step of the way. How do you draw near to God? You turn all your decisions over to God. You let the angels go out before you. When you hear them marching on the treetops above you, when you hear God sending his warriors out ahead of you, know that the victory is with you, that God is with you. So that is the message of how do you draw near to God. So the more you seek God, the more you seek to desire God, the more you reach out for God, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That is what our Father's promise is. That means it's a guarantee. His word never fails. His word is never broken. You want to draw near to God? You have a desire inside you. You wouldn't be watching this video this far if you didn't. Seek him in the scriptures. Seek him in fellowship. Listen, emphasize your personal relationship, but parallel that with the study of the scriptures because the Holy Spirit will teach you, teaches us through those words. You cannot understand it without the Holy Spirit. And when you begin, Holy Spirit, be with me. And even when you're outside of the scriptures, when you're going into a job interview, Holy Spirit, be with me. And don't be amazed if something that you learn by accident, without your own intention, the day before that interview is a question the man asks you and you answer it and the man is impressed and that's one of the reasons that you get that job. If you want to draw near to God, you have to seek him out and you have to change the way you think. You have to change the desires of your heart to align with our Heavenly Father. You have to change those decisions. You have to be able to look and look at decision-making processes and say, these are the way of the world and I do not use them. These are the ways of God and that is how I will make my decision and that is how I will live. That is how I will decide a job. Even if it's the lowest paid job, if that's the one God says he wants me to get, then that's what I'm gonna do and I will trust God to pay my rent. I will trust God to give me the money to feed my children and to clothe them. I'm gonna trust God and I'm not gonna think the way the world says. I'm not gonna decide the way the world decides. I'm not gonna behave the way the world behaves. I'm going to be a man called apart and I'm going to stand on the mountaintop with the flag and I'm gonna say, here is the way of God and I'm gonna let them come to me but I will not return unto them. This is the man from Modesto reminding you as always to pray or be defeated.